we'll begin. My name is Clyde Tabor, and I am with the Visual Story Network, and welcome to our Media to Movement Global Survey Results event. Um, we're pleased that you have joined us today, and we're gathering to reveal the results of the global survey that many of you participated in in January and February. So I'm gonna go through a quick orientation. This is what we're doing in our session today. We're going to talk about what do we mean by media to movements. We're gonna have key findings from the survey. We're gonna have a response to those findings. We'll have some case studies. We're going to have some resource sharing, including yours. And then we're gonna go into breakouts according to your area of interest. Um, to keep this as engaging as possible, we're gonna keep the longest presentation to 15 minutes. We're gonna have several polls. We're gonna have an opportunity to learn about your resources. We encourage you to use the chat box as well as the Q&A box. Chat for chat and, and, and resources, questions and answers in the question and answer box. Um, at EMDC last year in Holland, a group of people got together involved in providing training in this media to movements sector and we began to explore how we could become more synergistic. And so these respective organizations, Visual Story Network, TWR Motion, Kavanaugh Media, M13, Frontiers, Kingdom Training, and Media to Movements are a part of what we're just calling this Media to Movements Training Coalition. Um, in addition to those folks who were responsible for this survey, we also had some additional co-sponsors and a special thanks to Strategic Resource Group, Media Impact International, Crowd Trust and launch M to DMM. Here's our first poll. I'm going to launch this now, and you will have a few seconds to answer this question. Um, tell us about your primary roles within your organization. Are you a DMM, CPM practitioner, media to movement practitioner, scripture engagement, pastor, leader manager, digital strategist, networker, and educator? And while that's going on, I'm going to, um, if I can, maybe I can't. Yeah, I'm going to just take a moment and honor two saints who are champions in the media to movement strategy sector who were called home in recent days. Rob Harvey was very active with the media to movements of the 2414 coalition. He was very interested in the media movements coalition. He was on his way home two weeks ago from a gathering at Saddleback Church as the part of the finishing the task group. And he died from a, a brain aneurysm, sadly, on his 48th birthday. We miss him very much. He is survived by his wife, Mary, and six of their seven children. We also sad to say goodbye to Melody, who was born and raised as an MK in North Africa. She served faithfully on the Kingdom training team. She passed away last week after complications from a chest infection stemming from her lifelong battle with cystic fibrosis a day after her 27th birthday. She is survived by her husband, Jonathan. So I will stop the poll now, and I think you guys should be able to see the results. Can you guys see the results? Or is it only me? This is the first time. Oh, share results. How about that? You're able to see these results, Tom? Can you just, okay. So we we've are, got, yes. um, yeah, 38% DMM, CPM, 21% uh, media to movement, 15% scripture engagement, a few pastors, God bless you. A number of us more in that leader manager sector, a pretty big chunk in the digital strategy sector. Hey, look at that, a lot of networkers and quite a few educators. Okay, that's interesting. Um, anyway, that's great. That was really helpful. Thank you for letting us know who you are. Um, I'm gonna do a quick detour here and talk about a few resources um, that are available. The first is um, our wiki. Uh, you'll have this in the executive summary and we'll be able to see this, but you'll have um, this link, visualstory.org forward slash M2M will take you to 
this link right here. And I'll just highlight a few of the things. We try to curate and aggregate best practices and products. So there's quite a few resources here. You'll see the training resources, Kingdom Training, the MMU course, John's Christian Media Marketing Podcast. There's, there's 40 lessons from Mobile's Media and Ministry, Launch M to DMM. There's additional training, Zoom A, MII, Mobile 10. Then we've got other websites that have a lot of deep dive content. We've got a little upcoming event section. And then when we do events like the one we do today, we have executive summaries. And you'll find some of those there. There's software, prayer, and then some connecting resources. So um, that's one resource. Um, again, if for the executive summary, we'll make this clear in the email that we follow up with. You'll find that hopefully by the end of the day at visualstory.org slash m to m survey. Um, If you will, um, sorry you guys, I'm checking through my notes. We'll have a segment towards the close of this session where you'll be able to highlight your, your resources. So use the chat box now to put in a URL and a two or three sentence description if you have a very specific media to movement resource. Our team will be highlighting some of those towards the latter portion of this. And then um, I will pass it on. We're going to hear from um, Tom and Amber. Our training coalition met on a monthly basis after we met at EMDC. And one of the needs that surfaced was to do a survey to find out how is media to movements being used around the world. And so we had those 12 co-sponsors that I mentioned. We launched a survey on January the 13th with Dr. Frank Preston as the lead researcher. Today we're releasing the results of that survey. The slides will be included in the executive summary that you'll get the link to or you'll get the email for. We'll also send an email alert to those who are here and who've registered to get the full report, which will be lengthy. We don't have that ready. That will be later, available later in April. And again, put your questions and answers in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You can also vote or upvote or downvote questions you think are more important because we'll have a Q&A time after Dr. Frank. And so I will pass it over to you, Tom and Amber. All right, thanks, Clyde. Let me get my screen shared here. And I think it needs to move slightly. Hang on. Okay, I think everyone can see my, my slides here. I need to minimize a couple of things. And uh, it's really good to, to be with you. I get to do a little bit of an overview related to media to movements. Many of you know uh, about media to movements, but this diagram that I'm showing here represents what we call a funnel. And it's really just a way to envision how things work, important pieces are identified in it. Um, but what I really think is important is that we focus on this down here at the bottom of the funnel. Um, it's the end we all have in mind. And it doesn't matter what our specific expertise or calling is, um, we can all look ahead toward this ultimate goal of seeing multiplying groups of multiplying disciples in whatever form it takes. And this is something that takes um, a shared vision and commitment. Um, at every level, um, whether it's the field level between team members and teams from other organizations, but we find that it, it generally takes a lot of people and a shared vision and commitment toward this. What we're trying to do with this idea of a funnel is see the gap that exists between people who are seekers and who exist in, you know, in any culture. We, you know, we, we talk about this idea of seekers existing, you know, everywhere, no matter how unreached, and this gap between joining them into groups like this. And what we want to do is help each end find each other. Seekers need to find disciple makers, even though they may not know it right now. And disciple makers want to connect with seekers, but it's often a very hard challenge in unreached places. And the funnel gives us an, a, a way to think about a process that can help this. So we think about media and different tools we can use. Often God seems to be using uh, tools like media to first engage with someone who is seeking answers. 
the filtering section, and these things will become much more concrete as we look at case studies, are where people like online responders can help engage and answer questions and help people find, you know, move along in a path. And on the ground, we've got the coalition. So this is the, what we would typically say on the field, not necessarily, um, where people can connect and disciple and train to see, facilitate groups being formed. Um, each of these pieces is important and they're interdependent. And with, if a piece is missing, it's hard to make these connections. And what I think is beautiful about what God is doing right even here today is this kind of mutual commitment and trust that exists between many organizations and teams. Um, and then the last thing I want to emphasize is that this is a picture and not a prescription. We see how these pieces work and we see their value, but it's never as simple as a, a diagram like this. It looks different in different places. But what we want to see today, what you're about to see, is how God is using all these pieces, different giftings and callings, and linking us together in something that looks like this. And so that's what we're going to hear about more in detail today. And I'm going to hand it over to Amber now, and she'll uh, share us with some global perspective on this. Thank you, Tom. And as Tom highlighted, the bottom of the funnel is at the core of what we're going to be talking about today. It's disciple making. Obedient disciple makers all over the globe who are passionate about making disciples who make disciples. Many of these disciple makers are using digital strategies to find and engage with spiritually open people to further accelerate a movement in their country. This map you're looking at is representative of 73 of those unique field teams in 50 different countries who either responded to the survey or have a relationship with a trainer or coach from either Missions Media U or Media to Movements, Kavanaugh or Kingdom Training. And these 73 teams share four core characteristics. First, they have a team of at least two dedicated people, whether it be national and or expat, who champion the country-specific vision of leveraging media to identify and engage with spiritually open people, as well as mobilize and partner with local disciple makers to join the unified disciple making efforts. Secondly, they have a country-specific evangelistic website and or use a culturally appropriate social media outlet to run ads, post, or to push contextualized content. Thirdly, they use some form of customer relationship management system, such as disciple tools or smarter tools or just a plain Excel spreadsheet. They keep track of individuals who respond to them via web form, phone, or online messaging. This CRM also helps keep track of the disciple maker who connects with that individual face-to-face. -face. And then lastly, a launched team is characterized by a team who has a field follow-up network of some sort, whether that's two or 50 people. So with these characteristics in mind, you can see the regions where these teams, these 73 teams are located. The darker the circle, the more teams are represented. And for security reasons, we're not gonna represent the individual countries, but it is encouraging to see where the varying degrees of activity that teams are generally located at. A large concentration of the activity is centered around the 1040 window, where the majority of the remaining 7,000 unreached people groups currently reside. The last map I'd like to show you represents the global and regional partners who responded to the survey. It is not complete, nor does it represent all the media groups, organizations, or ministries who are engaged in broadcasting culturally appropriate media to specific regions or globally. But it does give you an idea of the broader reach and the necessity, as Tom was talking about, for field partnerships. The, lo the location of the circle or oval represents their unique focus geographically. And many of the media partners Many of the media partner groups generate leads for the 73 plus teams represented in the previous maps. Okay, I am going to unshare here. Hang on. All right, Frank. I think we're going to Frank, right? 
Frank, yeah, you, you're up. And Dr. Frank Preston is our lead researcher and has spent a fair amount of time working on this over the last 90 days. First of all, I want to thank everyone who participated in the survey. Um, uh, this was probably the best data set that I've ever had to, had a chance to work with. And I've worked with some pretty high level stuff with Pew Research level stuff with the government. Um, so this was really a fun data set. Second of all, I want to thank this team. If you can tell that these are a lot of really sharp people and uh, they have done things uh, that just astound me, such as how to run this uh, Zoom call. Um, so why don't you go into the next one, uh, Tom? Okay, uh, we wanted to make sure as we started out, what was our good research questions? And front, well, some of the things we wanted to do was what were some of the outcomes in terms of movements? And uh, I wanna say that this is actually a high level executive summary and presentation mode. Um, so it's, I'm not gonna really go deep. Um, I'm just gonna kind of hit on the highlights. About April 10th, we'll come out with a full research paper and, uh, and that will actually go more in depth. Plus I'll, can, we can be available to help answer questions. But the second thing we wanted to look at was uh, immediate movements practices, fruitful practices. Go back, Tom. Um, and then uh, CRMs, as uh, Amber talked about, and then you, how data was used or being used. And finally, what was the internal systems that people used to develop a, a meeting movement project and strategy? Go into the next one, Tom. <coughs> we used a mixed methods approach, which is both quantitative and qualitative. We did about 131 quantitative surveys. And uh, those quantitative surveys actually had uh, four choice questions as well as open-ended questions. Those questions we I did on purpose that way so that people could be freely answered with uh, their own perspective. And then we recoded the data. And a lot of this is recoding and we had coders check to make sure that the coding was done properly. If you don't understand this, that's okay. Uh, this is my job. The th we had actually had a response rate of about 22%, which is unheard of, unheard of to have that level of from the greater population. And notice that basically two thirds were expatriates and we had about a quarter were nationals. That is just fabulous type of work. And then as uh, Amber mentioned, about three quarters of it was Muslim outreach and was uh, heavily uh, biased in uh, Middle East. And it was not very organizational dependent. So we had a good cross population. Go to the next one, Tom. Um, if you can see this as who are implementers. And I noticed as we look through the research project, um, about 56% of the people who actually did the survey implemented the training that they went through, which was tremendous. Um, and then another, tw another 24% is middle range. So those could actually be considered implementers, but they're ramping up into their implementation. And then the 23%, as I go through and, and discuss with, uh, I was reading the data on them, those people are working together their research together, their, their project together. They're gathering resources, they're, uh, uh, working with their leadership team, but laying down the foundation. So we really had a very high number of people who were implementers. Uh, those who did not implement is around 21%, and I think there's some good reasons for that. Um, some of it had to do with the team. So go to the next one, Tom. Some of the best practices that I observed that effective teams were, first of all, motivated. I'm going to be talking about these in a few minutes, but I'm just trying to give you a roadmap. They were cross-trained and coached. They did their homework and laid down a good foundation for launching a project, and then they just started. They worked uh, paralysis by analysis sort of approach. They just dove in. And then the next thing was a multi-organizational and indigenous. Go on, Tom. Um, and then I want to talk about what they were motivated. Can you flip to the next one, Tom? Look at this at uh, those whose desire to take the training, 66% was to increase effectiveness. This is fabulous. It was basically almost two thirds of the people. And as I read through some of the, some of the answers, those who said they want to increase effectiveness was things such as one person said, I was in ministry for eight years and saw no fruit. Uh, and I said, we got to do something different than what we're doing for the last eight years. They launched a mediated movement strategy and they says we have had more uh, engagements, conversions, and baptisms in the last six months than we had for the eight years previous to that. I had about four or five people who wrote the same sort of kind of approach. So they just had a desire to increase effectiveness. Now notice in here, there's a lot of people who are on this call who are supervisors and are leaders. Those who actually encourage your people to take, to take surveys generally did not implement. 
they were gaining education. And so, uh, so I think we need as supervisors help not only just give people training, but help them learn to implement, help them give them the empower them to implement. But the motivation part affected this. Um, go on time to the next one. How did it impact ministry practice? So they desire was to, uh, to change their, uh, their outcome effectiveness. Uh, almost 50% of the people who actually went through a training did see their ministry practice changed. Uh, and then the middle range is those people who saw some part of the ministry practice in Kate empowered. And only a few people, 14%, saw little to no impact as results of going through the training. As I looked at cross correlations and those, generally those people were not implementers uh, of the ministry, uh, of, the, of the training. So go on to the next one, Tom. Uh, they developed a ministry plan. Now this is a, actually first step of intentionality. If you develop a plan, it's a good chance you're actually gonna do what you said you wanted to do. Uh, fully developed plans were 7%, uh, developed was another 30, and then mid-range was 33%. So people was, were impacted both in their behavior by, by developing a media ministry plan. And then in process, those people are gathering together materials and resources necessary to launch a ministry plan. They're thinking through on it. They're doing the personas and doing their homework. Only 10% did not, did not develop a plan. Let's go to the next one, Tom. Uh, this is actually a very telltale, uh, the very critical point. Media integrated into their team strategy. In other words, they went through many years of not having or having some period of time where they said they want to increase effectiveness. Now they're doing a team change. Fully integrated was 21% and integrated 27%. Roughly 50% of the people who went through the training, their, their team changed. And uh, middle range is, again, if you want to include that one, it's close to 75%. And then you got 18% are in process. They're discussing as a team on how they go about uh, in, uh, implementing this strategy. So the big thing here to take away is it had a high impact. Okay, Tom, go to the next one. The other thing is, is that we want to look at is effective teams just start. Tom, go to the next one. Uh, we looked at recommendations from practitioners, what they said as they have gone through it, what do they recommend people to do? Uh, two, the two of the top four, two of them go together very well. They just did it and they need to make a team. And this was actually a very strong point that I'll talk a little later on. Team is a very important part. Uh, either people need to get teams within their own group or they need to get teams outside of a, their organization. But the big thing is they just did it. They launched into it. So we're going to figure this thing out as we go along. Okay, Tom, go to the next one. They're cross-trained and coached. Go ahead, Tom. This was a th extremely surprising to me. We have multiple trainings uh, involved in this group here. We've got MII, we've got uh, Kingdom, uh, Kingdom Training, uh, MMU, uh, the blog. What we observed was no pattern of sequence and training. People didn't go from uh, good to our, like entry level to mid level to high level. They actually people took all of them all over the place. They said they just took what was convenient to them. But what was observable that there was no sequence in training. They just took multiple ones to, at different times. They did take multiple trainings. And we saw that what people would do is that they were hungry to learn. So that as results, they wanted to gather as much information as possible. They took all kinds of trainings. Uh, in different ways. And, and, and another interesting thing, there was no previous background in media. I would have thought that people would have come in there, could be having a media background. Most people were coming from, who were actually implementers, were coming from a church planting or field, field background. And they says, I can learn media. Uh, people who had a media background, I don't think they made as well of an implementation over to a, into a strategy, but unless they were, unless they were uh, embedded into a team. Uh, that had field people. And then successful teams had a coach. And this was interesting because people just made an assumption on this. They didn't discuss it a lot. And you'll see this through the data, but they, as they talked in their, uh, in the qualitative part, they continually talked about the coach. Go ahead, Tom. They also were more multi organ and indigenous. And this has warmed my heart to see this occur. Okay, Tom. Uh, what we found is that when people were discussing how they actually did field follow-up, they looked at, they used their own current team for the follow-up, and this was probably because they're working at a local level, but as they begin to have respondents move outside their team, they included countrywide coalitions and others, uh, local churches, team uh, partners, and then a few actually did virtual follow-up. But it seemed to me as people did virtual follow-up, it was because they didn't have anyone who was able to connect with the, with the 
with a field person. So they actually opted for a, a, a less desirable approach. So virtual is not the primary go-to place. It was uh, our own team, our other teams to connect with a person face-to-face, -face, real people. Okay, go on, Tom, to the next one. They actually did their homework. I'll flip down to the next one, Tom. Look at this, 28% uh, after they went through the training, went back and did their research prep. They tried to figure out the persona, they developed their teams, they uh, looked at what kind of media was being used in the field, and they actually started out by thinking through what it's gonna to take to launch a media strategy. And then after that, once you have the information, you really don't, the, it's the unknowns that, that catch you off guard. And so 17% of the people, 17% uh, recommended just experimenting. You gotta keep trying different things to make it fly. And, uh, and it was really quite fun how people, as I read through their, their conversations, did do all kinds of interesting experiments and, and then they made a decision. This doesn't work, we're moving on. We're not stopping, we're gonna try something else. Go ahead, Tom. Gap areas, and this is the one that we are really wanting to focus on as a research project. What are the things that we need to do to help, that help teams? And hopefully those of you on the call can look at this and think, is there maybe some pieces of this that we can take on? Go on, Tom. Uh, 28%, oh, if we looked at it, about 48% of the people who are implementers and around 64% of the people implementer, or 64% who took the training decided to use Disciple Tools as a, as a, um, uh, as a CRM. What CRM stands for is Customer Relations Management. It's the software and the hardware necessary to keep up with data inf information. And uh, I was encouraged because so many people were using a customer relations management years ago, just only just a couple of years ago, that number would have been extremely small. Now we have multiple people using it. Uh, but you see 23% of the people are not using anything, any type of CRM. And the reason this is important is because you can't do data analysis unless you're using something that can actually software to allow you to capture this. And then 10% are using uh, uh, Excel and others, and then smarter tools and uh, Salesforce. But uh, the ones, uh, the other ones, except for Salesforce and Echo, don't really give you the good analytics. And smarter tools give you analytics also. So you have still 23, 10, 10, that's probably close to what, 40 some odd, 50, 43% is really don't have any way of doing analytics. Tom, going on, move to the next one. Teams need training and metrics toward DMM. So this is a media to DMM. And the reason we use DMM is because it is a disciple making movement. So we find that media is best able to identify persons of peace and drive toward a church planting movement. It's not about proclamation, it's about identifying seekers. And what we found is that when people were uh, looking for metrics on how they were successful, they tend to lean toward engagement, conversions, and sacraments, which are very important things to be to be measuring, but those are only in individualistic conversion mentalities. Um, when you looked at growth and reproduction, which is core to DMM, uh, thinking and processing, very few people measured toward that direction. And I think we need to actually help go back and re pe help people learn a little more deeper, what is DMM? Why is it such an effective? It's not about conversions, and conversions is, is a step toward uh, a movement. And sacraments important to movements and engagement, but the 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 golden ring toward a creating a church planting movement is growth and reproduction. We're our uh, we're and our uh, practitioners are not do, using those very well. Go to the next one, Tom. Teams needing training on how to use data. I think people's eyes roll to the top of their head when they think of data because they think it's not not important. And in fact, of those people who actually have a CRM, sixty five percent don't use the data. This is key because they could, this can tell them who, what kinds of people are responding, better inform them on who's open for religious change. And we've written some articles about this. Um, uh, most people do use a CRM who do use it for coordinating of the field and recording interactions and deployment resources. Uh, but the bigger factor here is that people are just not using the data effectively. They have the tools, they're just not using them. Okay, Tom, move to the next one. Teams needing training on where seekers are ready for follow-up. And as this is, a, a, as different people have talked about, this is the middle level of funnel. How do you filter a person who's ready for, for turning over to the field? 42% of people didn't have anything to add. They didn't really know how to go about filtering someone toward uh, a, uh, uh, are they ready for a church planting? Some people had sharing, 
13% and 21% were seeking. And those are just people who said, I'm interested in becoming a believer. But the, in terms of the DMM part, they were not looking for engage or obey, uh, gauge to study, willingness to study, or going face to face. Those are core factors of a DMM strategy. So they're looking again, I don't know what to do, or I'm actually looking at people who want to be converted. Uh, instead of looking at people at, from a loop 10 to that within this population. Um, now let's go to the next one, Tom. Um, then recommendations from practitioners. Uh, they had uh, deeper training on how to launch. A lot of people had nothing to add, but then other people felt case studies were important and the launch simulation. Those are how someone else did it. And I think we can do a better job at helping see people see how they could do it. And then coaching and uh, starter kit was the next two. Help me learn how to do it. More people need help. Okay, Tom, go on. Observations and uh, gap areas. I'm going to recap here. Uh, uh, effective teams are motivated, cross-trained. They do their homework. They just launch and are multi-organizational and indigenous. Okay, Tom. Um, and then what is our big gap areas? We need advanced training on how to use a CRM, the purposes and ability for it. Training on how to use data in campaigns from both seed to fruit and then training on how to pass on someone to a field contact. And then last one is a help center to handle special issues. We got people who really have some special needs and we need to pass this on to them. Thank you very much. Uh, Thomas is the next one. Um, this is where we move into Q&A. Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Frank. Yay. Um, and this is where Tom and Brian are gonna help um, curate some of the questions. So let's keep sharing that screen, Tom, if you don't mind. Um, just with that Q&A, and then we'll keep it in gallery view for the recording. So, uh, Brian, do you have anything that you, you can throw to Frank really quickly? And anybody else who has any questions for Frank, this is your chance. But so use the Q&A box. Q&A box we can look at. There's a, uh, S has a question about growth. Frank, you mentioned on one of your earlier slides, uh, uh, growth is one of the uh, survey responses. Could you explain what you meant by growth? Growth is uh, whenever uh, a person we have identified as a person of peace, they've actually um, go on and they start growing the movement, if you want to call it that. They grow individually as they grow in the movement, but they, uh, it's not so much, it is discipleship, but it's discipleship that leads to re reproduction. It's not accumulating more information, but it's actually how you take this information and pass it on to others. And as a result, you'll see others become believers. And then this is uh, the Second Timothy 2.2. The things which you hear from many presence when you, with things which you hear from many presence many witness these entrust the faithful men who in turn will teach others. We need to teach people on how to grow others. Uh, so young converts uh, are teaching, leading people to faith, and teaching them how to grow. So that's growth. Okay, Brian and Tom. Anything else you see? Um, yeah, um, Islam S asked about the best tools to analyze data. Is there a, uh, a quick answer to that, Frank, or can you send? Uh, this send is someone? something. No, I don't think there's best tools for that. It would actually be what you want the data to do, and this is where your coach comes in involved, and this is where uh, other experts can come in to help you to figure out what is it you need to know, and how you're going to obtain the information, and then what tools you're going to use to collect and need what you need. The goal is to stay simple to get exactly what you need, but don't try to bring in the Queen Mary of data analytics. You just want to use what's simple and necessary to answer your question. All right, thanks. Anything else? Brian and Tom? I'm, I'm and I know there's a lot of activity in the chat. <laughs> um, here's a- okay, We've got a couple questions yeah. that I think we'll try to answer. Go ahead, go ahead Tom. No, 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 Brian, you go. Yeah, I've got a, a couple of questions about uh, that are more related to examples, case studies. We will bring up some of those case studies later on, so we'll, we'll hold on those questions for right now. Okay. Yeah, Tom. anybody else? Just thoughts or comments for, uh, for Frank and the research? And again, we'll be um, making these slides available in the executive summary today. The full like data research report will not be available for a few more weeks and we will notify you when it does become available. 
Yeah, I'm looking at some of the other things. I think, you know, so um, Bob Bartz and Don and Steven, I think let's, let's, uh, John's going to talk some stuff about some analytics and Facebook. I think some of those things might become more clear as John shares. Let's, let's keep going on, but we'll, we'll save these questions also for breakouts. Let me just make one more thought here is that the data is really rich. Uh, those of you who are working on masters or PhDs and you need to kind of like want to have a really cool project to work on, I'm perfectly happy to mentor you through your PhD uh, and help you give you the data to help out. Um, so this is wow. a, really, a good data set. That's very generous for anybody who is in so inclined, which would not be me. <laughs> <laughs> Bless the researchers. What, maybe just Frank, what surprised you? What are, I mean, like, what what really caught you off guard? I think it's how little people are actually understanding DMM. They understand how to get convert, how to get people open for religious change, but then what to do with them after they after they find them. Um, I think it's because people have been involved in a kind of a desert zone for so long, and all of a sudden now they got thirty people coming at them. And they're going, holy Toledo, let's get them all saved. Um, and not really thinking about, no, our goal is to actually create a church planting movement. And so they forget all the good, cool principles that they've learned in their, in their CPM classes or, or thing, and they're not applying them correctly. And I think this can be something that can help you slow down. We can help coach you toward that direction. How to use media, to start a church planting movement. And uh, one of the early ones, have we seen any movements? No, we haven't. And I think it's because we're misfollowing principles on DMM. All right. The media, media is doing its part. I think our field guys can grow in this area. All right. Any final thoughts, questions for Frank? Other than Frank, I think Eddie said he thinks you just you just picked up a student. So I hope you I'm sure you were serious. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well then uh we'll move on. And as John shares his screen, um We'll hear a response from the results of John Rawls of Kavanaugh Media, followed by four case studies, including one from John. We'll be having another Q&A at the end of the time after John and the case studies. So put your questions in the Q&A box. It makes it easier for our team to monitor because there's so much happening in the chat. John is involved with dozens of teams around the world and I think is the best media campaign developer for media to movement on the planet. So we're very privileged to have so many experts in this room today as our panelists, and that includes our case studies. So we'll hear from John Rawls and Kavanaugh Media giving a response to the research. All right, well, I'm not sure how much of a response though. I will say if you're looking at the slide, that is me. If you look at my video right now, I shaved my beard down uh, for two reasons. One of the COVID-19, I was told I should do that. And also, if you notice, the picture has a ton of gray in it, which there's nothing I can do on that part. But uh, my name is John. I am a part of Kavanaugh Media, which is a business as mission endeavor. And then I also have the Christian Media Marketing Podcast, which that has been going on for about six months now. It's continuing to grow. We're over a thousand people that listen to that. And so that's exciting. That is 10 to 15 minutes each week where we do this. I love the church. I love it in all of its forms. I love the Bible. I love media. And I love the field of communication. That's what I did my graduate work in. I love Jesus. And ultimately, I want every person just to know him. In this whole funnel, from the top to the bottom, there are areas where each of us are kind of have our niche of where we're kind of falling into. And for me, that's been the top of the, of the tunnel. I am working in 50 different countries with 12 different mission organizations. I've got access to over a hundred and some different admin level accounts of Facebook ones I'm using. And that's driving some of what I want to do here, especially from what Frank has done and the great research that he has presented to us. And so let me, uh, let me share a few thoughts here as we move forward. The very first thing I want to share with you is that this you can get caught up in a lot of this going analytics, CRM, pixels, retargeting, the kind of world that I live in, and you can do everything right and not have a movement. We can't prescribe that. As, as Tom already said, this is not a recipe where you just add two campaigns and a shake of this or that or whatever, and then God's just magically going to do something. Ultimately, this is a spiritual endeavor. 
And so though we're using media and though we're going face to face and we're online and offline, all of that, ultimately, this is just a spiritual endeavor. And you know, one of the things as I was doing a training with Global Gates and with David Garrison, who did a ton of research in CPM, we were talking about the lack of movement so far. And he said, of course, you're in the very beginning of this. This is pioneering work that we all are involved with. And so, yeah, we're trying to learn what are people doing. And as Frank has brought up, here's areas where we need to grow. But ultimately, we can do everything right and not see a CPM or a DMM or whatever but we can push the kingdom forward. Now, this was all part of a 45-minute um, plenary that was going to happen at EMDC. I'm making this thing down to eight minutes, and so I'm just going to skip through a bunch of this. But another aspect that I would like for you to make sure that you're thinking about as you listen to this today is just what is your ultimate priority? What are you really pursuing? Because one of the things that I'm seeing with a lot of teams is that they're getting into it and then they're getting sidetracked. Either they are spending way too much time working on an element of a video and they, they take two months to make it and then it doesn't, it flops. They don't get any response from it or they get caught up in, they're trying to do media and they're trying to do media to movements, but they're also trying to do English camps over here or these things, this thing over here or whatever. The result of that is that they get torn and they don't put the effort and time into it. You need to know why and what it is that you're doing. And that's gonna mean that you have to say no to some stuff and that you understand what is your end goal. And what is it, what is it that God has called you and your specific ministry to do? What I'm seeing happening is that great people and great ministries then are, are branching out and going, you know what, we need to be doing this now, or we need to add this to it. And every time you add something, you're pulling away your ability to focus in on that one thing or maybe two things that I think God may be calling you to do. And so what I really want to dive into in the time that I have here is this whole idea of practicing. What are you failing at? There's this idea of Occam's razor, which is when all things being equal, the simplest solution tends to be the best one. And yet there's also this idea of a narrative fallacy. And a narrative fallacy is this idea where we look backwards and we are trying to attribute this linear, discernible cause and effect change to the knowledge that we see. And so if you've taken certain courses, you'll even see where we have like a pathway and here's the minimum viable product that is given. And it's easy to look at that and think, well, we just need to do this, this, and this, and we're just going to have a movement. And part of that is the danger is, is that if we keep saying, well, here's my story is that we look at things and we attribute stuff that has no bearing about whether it really had an impact on it. That's why data is so important. The minimum viable product is meant to be this idea of you build something, you measure it, and you learn from it. So you're trying stuff and it's failing, it's not working, but failure itself, well, that's not failure, that's a gain. And so when we're measuring and we're learning, then if we're not doing that, well, we're not moving forward. So we want simple, but the truth is a lot of what we do isn't simple and the world isn't simple. And we have to be really careful that we don't just try to simplify this to the point where we go, oh yeah, we'll just run two ads and then get this and then we're just done. It just doesn't work that way. In fact, it's getting harder, certain aspects of this funnel. Facebook and, and Google and others, they're just making our job a lot, a lot Harder. And so we can only reduce this so far, which is why we need to continue to listen to multiple stories and to be analyzing what's happening right now to make sure we're learning from it. So the creativity without that feedback mechanism means we're just getting white noise. And so it's really important for us to be speaking into all of these things with a critical mind. And so that means we need to make new mistakes instead of continuing to make the same mistakes over and over and over. If we remove failure from the innovation of what we're trying to do, it's like removing oxygen from a fire itself. So practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice does. And so each test that you do gives you a small bit of knowledge. You're learning from stuff. So for example, I've learned that the color yellow is open over 60% more often than other colors. The reason I found that out is because I ran ads, hundreds, thousands of ads to begin to see which one is tracking better. And this quote, as you can see on the screen, is coming from a great book that I recommend. It's called Black Box Thinking, 
why most people never learn from their mistakes, but some do. It's a great book and has really challenged me to think about how we approach this. So after analyzing 110 pages in ad accounts, what I'm seeing is that the average team is running 1.8 ads per month and is spending $84, about $85 in ad spend monthly. Their average monthly reach is close to 32,000 people, and their average click-through ratio is about 0.9. Well, the 0.9 is what Facebook average itself is, just across the board. And I just wanna challenge all of you that are on this call, we have to be running more ads, and we need to be consistent. If you run an ad for a week or two, and then you stop for a month or two, you, you don't have that momentum and you're not getting enough reps in it. You're not getting enough chances to try things and to learn from it. And so we need to move forward on that whole process. So I'm challenging us to do more and to do it so that we can continue to learn. Finally, and then I'm going to show my case study here, we need partners. Now, it's easy to look at that in a transactional part, but the truth is we all have a part to play. There's unreached, there's movement, there's formalized, there's institutionalized, all of this stuff that happens, but to keep a movement going forward, to press forward together, I think we need to lose the labels, put our hands to the plow, unite together simply as Christians. In that chat bar, I'm seeing all of you share, hey, here's resources we have. That's what we have to do. Content creators, we need dis discipleship people, we need technologists, we need data analysts, we need everyone playing a part. It doesn't mean that it's transactional in nature. Sometimes, yes, you have something, I have something. But you know, the truth is, when I was going through my heavy chemo, my boys had to carry me out of a chair some days. I had nothing off to give to them, really, besides love. We all have a part to play in the body. And it, it moves beyond this business mindset of transactional part to it. We all have something that we can do. And I believe that we will see movements, many of them in the world, if we can unite together to play our part. If we don't worry about whose logo is on it, if we just say, here's what I can offer, and we do that, great things can happen. So let me give you an example of a case study of one that's happening. This one just took place. This one was happening in Bangladesh, in London, in New York City, as well as in Turkey, in Egypt, in Pakistan, and several other locations. This was in partnership with the Jesus Film, using their clips, to be able to help uh, seekers to find out and to get prayer requests. So the whole thing, and I'm gonna show you the example of this. I've got two different case studies. This first one, we did two ads. The first one was just a very simple clip of Jesus doing the Lord's Prayer. Nothing magical about that. Less than one minute so that we could run it in Instagram and on Facebook. And then we put that out to those places. There was a tremendous amount of ad views. If they would click on the ad, then it went to a landing page. It was either an iframe on their own website or in a what's called Next Steps, which is basically a very fast version of a landing page that Jesus Film built out for some of these teams. And as you can see on this screen right here, we ended up spending $700 and we had ended up six face-to-face, -face, two accepted Christ as a result of that. We had over 156 people who accessed the Bible and downloaded that, and we can retarget everyone who did something from those ads. This is the thing that I was really excited about that we're testing with. So here's the first ad, and if they click on it, then it would take them to what you see right over here, this right part, which I'll use my little pointer that this part was the landing page built out. And so when they would go to that, if they watch this video at the end of the video, these questions show up on the screen. So it's almost like an embedded chat bot. And you just ask, did you like what Jesus taught about prayer? In their local language, of course. And then it would give them options. Do you want to talk to someone about Jesus? Do you want someone to pray for you? Do you want to have a Bible? Do you want to watch more? Each of these then were tags that show up in Google Analytics and in Facebook so that people can see what you can retarget based upon which button that they press. So the opportunities are amazing to be able to do that. Now, here is then the second ad that we followed up with them. Really simple. You'll notice the yellow there, black and white, because I wanted it to stand out in the midst of all the color pictures. And it just asked people, how can we pray for them? And we have received hundreds of messages, which helps us know what kind of content we need to create, 
how to pray for people, they are doing our persona research for us by telling us these pain points or spiritual longings. And just as a side note, one of the things that I'm noticing is that messenger engagement itself is up 70% in the last two months. And I think that you're going to see that go up tremendously, even as this COVID-19 and more and more people are at home. So I hope that these give you some examples of things that are out there. This is the top of the funnel, just trying to find seekers, then starting that online discipleship with them. There was one more real quick one. This one was an ad just praying for the country. This one was done. I was on a call with them yesterday for the city of, or for the country of Kosovo, where they had follow-up teams. They had 20 some thousand people who watched pretty much the whole video they had five five total negative responses and so continuing to learn and test trying things out and when they find something this team then shared it with other teams it's like one beggar telling another where to find bread or find food. And so that's that kind of partnership that I hope that we can get more and more of. So that's a few examples on that. There's more we can talk about. We're going to have a breakout session later, but I'm going to go now to one of my brothers here who I love tremendously. And he's going to share a little bit about one of his campaigns and a case study that he did over in the Middle East. So David, if you're on there, go ahead and make sure you're unmuted and take off. Yeah. Thanks so much, John. Um, I, I am a case of the people on this call and so appreciative of the partnerships and the relationships and the coaching that, that I have gotten. Uh, so I live in, and serve in the Middle East and would not be here today without the giants that have gone before me. So really, really thankful uh, for this collaboration. Whoosh, next. <laughs> so the, again, I live in the Levant region. And uh, whenever I got here, just saw a huge opportunity of the amount of time uh, people spend on social media. And then we, we came across a survey of, of believers from the majority background. 80% of them had gone online when they had spiritual questions. So it was a safe place to go because either they didn't know another believer or they couldn't enter into a brick and mortar fellowship often because they were regulated by the government. So uh, we said, hey, we want to meet people where they're spending much of time and when they're engaging with spiritual new ideas already. And so in 2002, 2017, 2018, we created some animation content. It's kind of our first content piece. And then we actually launched it in 2018 after we got some training from people on this call. And once we launched it, in the hopes of finding people either on Facebook and Google, uh, that are searching for truth and then getting those people into face-to-face -face relationships and discipling them for multiplication. So our, our hope is disciples making disciples and in groups. Um, so once we launched in 2018, we've getting a lot of uh, people messaging us through Facebook Messenger mostly, and we recognized the bottleneck was actually how many people can our online responders, um, kind of like a call center, how many people can your online responder respond to how, uh, X amount of numbers. So let's say you can only respond to 200 emails a day or 200 messages on Facebook a day. And a lot of those messages that we were getting in the inbox weren't from actual thirsty people. They were from people that wanted to just argue and debate. And so we were hoping to keep our, our time focused on those that are actually thirsty. And so one tool to help uh, try to alleviate this hurdle was that in early 2019, we developed or was shared with us a Facebook chat bot using a platform called MiniChat. And so in early 2019, to help relieve that bottleneck, we launched a chat bot on Facebook Messenger to try to filter out a lot of the people that just were arguing and not really thirsty. So that when they, we, at the bottom of the funnel, when they were, were actually thirsty, they could talk to a real person online before passing them off to a face-to-face discipleship relationship Whoosh. next and there's a link in there if you want to go back and get some of that content go for it um, and an email if you want more content so here's just one uh, over the past since we launched the automation funnel with the real person chatbot since early 2019 we've had 34,000 uh, private messages on our Facebook page which has led to 87 people that has requested a face-to-face -face meeting um, to find out more about engaging with the Bible and maybe even new professing faith in Jesus. 
that led to actually 39 people actually getting a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, so we see there's a drop off. So some people either get scared or numbers change. And then after that first first face-to-face -face meeting, 18 of them um, continued on in ongoing meetings or even have met four times face-to-face -face or longer, which has led to two baptisms. Whoosh, next. So just some lessons learned. Um, we wanted our campaigns online to be bathed in, in prayer beforehand. And we have an email list uh, from Nizun.org, but it doesn't actually mean people are praying. So we're going back to the drawing board of we want people to actually pray for the Middle East. And how can we get people praying? Because uh, we can't do this without the power of God. And then also there's a balance between automation and personal touch. So just asking yourself, what do you want your experience to be if you were going through this filter? Um, so we, we were too automated at stages or too personal too much personal touch at stages, and so trying to try to balance that. Good content doesn't mean great good results. Uh, we spent a lot of money on good content, and some of our best results came from not great content, not expensive content, content that's already out there. Mm -hmm. um, it became a lot easier with sharing platforms of different people across the region and people on this call. Uh, whenever we were all collaborating, sharing resources, so disciple tools or mini chat, it makes things a lot easier. And what works in one country doesn't necessarily work in another country. Uh, what worked in one country in the Middle East didn't necessarily work in another country. So constantly testing, constantly upgrading is some lessons learned that we're hoping to apply. Awesome, brother. And now we're going to go over to Asia, and we're then going to jump over to North Africa. But let's go to Lani in the Asia Pacific. Amber, if you wouldn't mind sharing your slides. Good morning, evening, everyone. This is just a case study from Asia. We call ourselves M13, which is taken from Matthew 13. But let me just start with terminologies here. Uh, you have heard a lot of them. Filtering focus on only two of them. Input of filtering is context. Output of filtering is P-POPs. What is P-POPs is potential persons of peace and defi defined as people who are willing to do spiritual face-to-face. -face. What is spiritual face-to-face -face is about meeting with the K-pops. So, uh, the meeting is about not just to solve their problem or issues or questions, but to start their spiritual journey or interest. Let me stop here a little bit, waiting for the terminologies. So we have heard a lot about viewers of media. That's kind of like not everyone responding to media. They can download the Facebook app. They can download the Bible apps and everything. But only when they respond to the media, we call them contacts. And then the filtering finishes with what we call P-pops who are willing to do a spiritual face-to-face. -face. We are already familiar with the next uh, funnel which is we not only want to do media, which can be mean sit so presentation and et cetera, on top of the funnel, but let's make sure we have the filtering component between the media and the field. Filtering is how media work can connect with the field work. Filtering is above line, which is the online work, while field is the below line, the offline work. I wanna show you one of the funnel here, a typical funnel that I'm sure many of you are already familiar with. The top one, uh, John has mentioned a lot about media part, the reach, the page views, the app downloads and everything. But let's make sure we have filtering, which start with context and conclude it with P-POPs. Over here, you can see of the almost 14,000 contacts, we only found 240 P-POPs. But that from the 240, 29 of them have shared, for example. Another lesson learned in our case is that scripture related campaign or scripture interest persona seems to be more effective than other types of event, other spiritual type persona. Scripture is used not just to help new believers, but also used to identify P-POPs. Scripture campaigns find 3% P-POPs compared to 2% in any other campaign. This is another funnel of our work in the last six years. We started our project in the country uh, about six years ago. We have about 200,000 contacts in our database. This is just to give you an idea on how much filtering is required. Almost 300 contacts daily that we are talking with. About 200 are what we call green, which is our focus group. 
uh, focus contacts and identify only one or two people per day. These filtering are done by live person, while bot can also help in the beginning states to reduce the human bot, human load as Keith already mentioned. I just wanna show a little journey here of our journey is in the last six years, we have been able to find about 16, 21 PPOPs, but 20% of them have been met face to face. And we have seen about 83 bapti uh, baptism. Well, in the last two years, we work with another group of uh, uh, team. They're only receiving about 135 PPOPs. They have met with about 50% of them. And yet look at the baptism rate. So of the 65 people they have met face to face, 41 of them have been baptized. This is two of three people that the field teams are meeting are baptized. How can we help field teams meet up with the only ready ones instead of just talking with everyone? Some of the do's and the don'ts for filtering. Filtering is about identifying PPOPs. It's not about counseling, evangelizing, teaching, or preaching. Filtering is about finding their motives. It's not about answering or debating their issues or their uh, ideas. And filtering is about building bridges, not just building walls. How do we do filtering? Uh, there are four questions that a lot of people are, have been asking me, but this is the four questions. The one is during the filtering process, we wanna ask them if they, we wanna find if they are open spiritually. And the identification is if they are interested with Injil or Isa al -Masih. And not only that, they need to be willing to do face-to-face, -face. again, not to talk about their issues or their daily needs, but it's about their spiritual journey. And another indicator is we ask them where is their location. This is very important so we can find the closest field team available near them. And the number four question is very important in terms of church planting movement, which is willing to share with others, group, uh, Frank's already mentioned is very uh, critical for CPM. So we want to even ask them to start sharing right from the beginning, even before they become a believers or seekers. How long to do filtering? You can see from the chart here, 21% of the PPOPs are identified within seven calendar days. And you can see it between within 30 days, you have be, we've been able to find 56% of the PPOPs. And yet there are still another 14% of PPOPs require more than four months to be identified. Some of them are still even two, three years before we actually identify them. Filtering is about being fast, don't delay responding to contacts, and yet we need to be patient on journeying with them. Thank you. All right, thanks. And we have one more presentation from, the, from North Africa. So 